uh, may the odds be in your favor. All right, so uh, to take us further, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to uh, call on a gentleman who will be talking about the business perspective to hardware production, development, and digital manufacturing in Nigeria. Uh, please join me, make welcome Mr. Chibukem Felix Amefule as he introduced the panelists and also moderate the panel session as well. Good afternoon, everyone. First, I want to start by welcoming my colleagues. My colleagues, uh, Ugo Okafo, please, and Julian Mbakwe. Thank you. I'll be quite uh, a little bit snappy to make sure that we have uh, a discussion right and at the same time have great to move to the next thing we have. First, um, I think the previous sections have done so much uh, work and made our work quite very easy, uh, from the supply chain to the human resource and uh, to the data protection we have and all that, because all these accumulate to product development. Because you can't talk about product development without talking about IPs, which data protection comes in. You can't talk about product development to commercialization without talking about our supply chain, which uh, we had the previous, and then the human resource, which is talent, which is at the heart of, because product development involves knowledge, and the knowledge is being embedded in people and not in the process, so to say, at some point. So it's people that has this knowledge, even though it can be transferred through a process. So, and uh, just to start uh, the discussion right away, I really want to have to kind of share your experience as to product development journey in Nigeria from the, from the point of developing products to the point of commercialization. Let me start with you, Mr. Ugo. Okay, um, my name is Ugo Kafo. Um, I'm a consultant for Nigerian foundries on the digital fabrication department. Prior to then, I was with the GE Garage. Now, um, what I'd like to say about um, product development in Nigeria is that there are a lot, a lot of challenges we currently face. The, a lot of people have um, interesting ideas that they want to develop, but some of the challenges we face is the supply chain, sourcing, sourcing um, components to uh, build their products. Other, other um, problems we've, we've um, faced are like when people come with their product, not, they're not able to really validate it in the market in terms of, okay, I have a fantastic product. I made a prototype. I want to make so many prototypes and send it out to people to evaluate it. So those have been kind of like... Um, uh, where a lot of um, innovators have problems. But generally, if you're working on like products that have, uh, are not very sophisticated, let's say you, you picked like a farming, a, um, this guy that built a device that um, helps farmers plant maize quickly in the farms. So in, in his own case, he was able to come to our facility when I was in the G garage. We could, we could we 3D printed prototypes. They could take it back. They could run it in the farm and get feedback immediately. A lot of people don't have those kind of... Um, uh, so, some people that are... What I'm trying to say is that if it's a simple product, it's easy to... Um, to come up with an, a solution, test it, and get an immediate feedback. But if it's a, if it's a more difficult pro, um, um, device, you probably spend so much time trying to build it 
and you have to spend so much of your resources and time, and by the time you come back to it, you could end up frustrated. But generally, um, what I would say is that um, uh, if you're working on a particular product, um, Can you hear me? Okay. So let me help here. Um, my name is Julian Mbakwe. I am the business development manager at Autodex, managing manufacturing business for Nigeria and Ghana. And before then, I was the engineering or manufacturing lead um, with Tranos. So um, one, alongside what um, Ugo has mentioned, um, the issue with supply chain, um, the issue with um, process, one of the biggest issue bringing in hardware, digital manufacturing, and business is number one, the competencies of developing product is always neglected by you know people in this geography. You know, assuming that I if if I have an idea of the problem I want to solve, there is no magical one that I can just swing and you know, override the process of developing a product. So when we talk about hardware, we are talking about ideation, we're talking about conceptualization, we're talking about design, engineering, prototyping, like he, he was saying. So that is something we've totally neglected. And it's always very difficult when you are gunning for digital manufacturing and you do not consider what happens before then. The second thing I want to mention is, you know, ignoring the idea that the industry has moved from mass production and is moving towards what is seen as mass customization. Now, what I'm trying to say is this, you know, we all know that the dynamics of customer taste is too aggressive these days. People just want something different. You could, be, you could be making this chair and somebody walks into your factory today and tell you, oh, I love this. Next tomorrow, somebody walks in here and say, oh, I love this, but can you give me with a different kind of leg, a different kind of leather? Do you understand? And they keep coming back. So this is um, something we are seeing the, you know, the global communities solve easily, of course, with adoption of technologies, but looking at Nigeria and hardware manufacturing is also a big problem. Um, now, I want to buttress something about supply chain a little bit. It's so complicated that, you know, like the speakers, I can remember their names, there was Harrison and some, guy, uh, some people who spoke about supply chain. You know, Isolating the key components of a, uh, a, of a value chain, if you're producing something, you realize that the solution, all right, you, you find out that the solution you have for your supply chain problem might be solved by an engineer. You know, why do I have to continuously go to China? Why do I have, I'm not saying China doesn't provide a solution, but if you have a problem with the timeline, all right, can we backward integrate? Uh, even if we're not backward integrating, is there a way we can make our way with this? So there are a couple of issues. Um, the, the rest count from government policies, the volatility of our money market, and so many factors that are really killing great products, all right? You know, they are actually great products, but they are really facing a whole uh, lot of short time. But I, I think couple of other questions might buttress on um, some of these things. Yeah, so thank you. I think, I think I wanted to go through these points of perspective of uh, probably the key highlights being mentioned here. I think the one of the uh, parts is research and development. Yes. Uh, which is one thing that a lot of uh, uh, startups, a lot of companies don't actually, actually pay attention to. And uh, if you check the companies that actually move, like the movers, in, out there in, the, in whether you look at Apple or Samsung and you check their budget every year and see how much it goes, even Hawaii, 
how much goes into R&D every year. You understand what product development goes in. But here in Nigeria, we have the mindset of fabrication, cut and join, and send to market. And it is something that we have disconnected to getting a, a product that can be multiplied and can be scalable. Because at the end of the day, you are building a fabricating a product. You're not also looking at the availability of the raw material. Yeah. Whether it, because it's available today, you think it's something that you will sell. Tomorrow you wake up and the material is no longer available because you don't even have an insight of what goes in, into bringing that material. And also, I think from what you're saying, is adoption of technology. A lot of people are quite you know, skeptical at adopting technology that will take their business from zero to one and also talent because there's so much of talent living in this country. And uh, even the ones we have are not from what school is coming out with, it's a whole, whole bargain. It's a whole different conversation I wanted to go. So these are, like, I think, from what you said, these are the like three major things I think I, pointed, I, I picked from the major issues around product development. One, R&D and funding. Second is the supply chain and you know, understanding that. And then the third is the talent. Because in as much as possible that I pointed out early, that's what we want to create systems, but it's how smart in like IPs, like R&D. I normally use this example for some Toyota. Toyota Highlander, I think Sienna, uh, the Avalon, all use the same engine, engine block. Why? Because it takes so much, about a year to 18 months, to actually develop a new engine. So I'm not talking about the Avalon, the different series, all the same series, all different series of Avalon, all different series of Highlander, and that of, um, uh, what's, what's it called? As a half CNN, all use the same engine. But, but it's really easy to just get the design it, the car, body, send it out, and all that, because at the heart of R&D, before you design an engine, it takes a team of probably 30 to 50 of 18 months to get something out, and that's so expensive. You're not paying these people $1,000 a month. Some might be paid 200000 300000 a year. And it's so massive to know have a team of that. So, but this is something we're not thinking in-house about in Nigeria. And I think this also will have to drive the conversation we can have going forward as to some of the things. So I wanted to just point out one key thing. And I think this question goes to you, Julian, in, uh, as to leading products. You have, have to work with raw materials. And in your time at Trenos, you have had to lead and create new products from different plastics to metals and all that. So what's like the insight you had as to sourcing products, like raw material? Okay, so if you're developing a product, all right, you know, we're talking about hardware products. So if you're developing a product, um, sourcing is always an issue, all right? Um, of course, I can give... Uh, <laughs> tons of lectures about this. I'm just thinking of how to break it down. But one important thing is the technicalities of sourcing is very important. You know, the, the, there is what we call co-creation in design thinking. All right? If you're, if you're coming, coming up with a product, let's say you want to build a smart meter, for instance. All right? From the moment that concept comes into the team and you're trying to come up with, you know, when we talk about design, some people think it's always about, you know, the technicalities. The conversations are part of design. The, the, the ideas, the, the mapping of problems to solutions are part of design. So when sourcing, it's very important to think about all the factors, you know, think all about design for manufacturing. Design for manufacturing, DFM, is a concept, all right, which is basically considering everything from how this product will be screwed, how the customer will use the product, it, how, would it be as, how would it be assembled together. So the, the, time, the moment you start sourcing it already, you try as much as possible to work with the engineering team. So it's more like my answer to your question, you know, is just as simple as the possibility of having a co-creation process whereby all through the time you're sourcing, you're designing, you're 
um, what do you, which word do we use for this again? Specifying product, whatever it is, as simple as bolt and nut, glasses, fabricated parts. If you're getting it from Nigerian foundries, if you're getting it from wherever you are getting them, all right, we need to make sure that it meets the purpose. It meet, and you need to make sure that it's been engineered to work. So it's not really like we want to build something and we know we are buying tons and tons of things. All right, the supply chain process needs to be as patient as possible to make sure that engineering have tested and there are technologies and processes to do this. All right, if you are going to the local market to buy, we already know the deficiencies we have in the local market. The technicalities are there. Do you understand? So, yes, for your product, you might be technical, but the moment you go down to um, Arena or Alaba market, all right, communicating what you have is a problem. So, you need to make provision for, you know, closing out that. So, I mean, it's a whole new world of engineering, you know, research and development and um, supply chain. It's a whole new world, but I mean, the solution, it works better the moment the process is interwoven. So, the supply chain is part of development. Development is part of supply chain. That's uh, as simple as that. I, I'll add to that. Um, like, in Nigerian foundries, a customer will come and say, I need this product and um, I want like five pieces of it. But sometimes you don't really tell us what this product is really going to do. So by in engaging the customer, find out that this is a product that is going to be in a very um, hard wearing environment. So the engineers will have to go back and look at, okay, we're going to melt metals that are going to give it more durability. And as he said, by adding more metals to your alloy, that's affecting your su supply chain. You have to know whether, okay, am, am I going to add more manganese to this steel? Am I going to add more chromium to the steel? And at the same time, the engineers that are working on the pattern, which um, now are using digital fabrication techniques like um, uh, CNC's to cut out the mold, have to be kept in the know about all these things because a small, a slight design, slight feature in your design using the wrong material can produce a very detrimental effect on the product itself. So, as you said, it's all teams working together, the, the people sourcing the product, people in engineering, people in quality control, all adding to make sure that what you produce is a very good product. Thank you. Thank you. I think I have another question for you. Uh, Mr. Gokafa, and uh, looking at, um, I personally know you are quite a revered uh, product architect, and we have worked with a lot of startups trying to build new products, new ideas. So, um, one of the questions I wanted to ask now is what are the pitfalls you think that you know, new products uh, for, from startups to corporate, what are the pitfalls that you sh they should be aware of? Why developing new products? Like, what are the brand core pitfalls you should be aware of? Okay. Um, I think the core pitfalls they should look at is are they designing a product for themselves or a product for public? The market. Yes. For the market, sorry. You know, a lot of people have nice ideas and it looks cool, but the market is not really looking for that. The market is looking for something that is going to solve a very good problem for them. For example, um, uh, when we were in the garage, a guy came up with a, a device that um, killed kill mosquitoes. So you hang it in your, your um, room, and when mosquitoes go in, like the electrical thing, it will uh, send out an electric um, shock that will kill them. It was a good product, but during the ideation pro um, process, we, we told him that it would be good to add more features to this product. And what, a feature could be that if it kills the mosquitoes and it counts them at the same time, that means that when you come in, if you hang that product in your room and you come back after 12 hours and you see 500 mosquitoes, you know that you have a mosquito problem. 
then we further said that it, you cannot just end it there. Maybe it should have a GPS module that you can send that data to a, 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 um, a cloud um, um, system so that it's not only killing the mosquitoes, it's counting the inform it's collecting the information and sending it to a database. So it was through feedback from people that he was able to say, okay, I don't just design something that is in my head or something that does much more things. So for one thing I would say, most you know, it pitfalls most people face is that you don't think holistically about the problem you're trying to solve. And um, it should, it's one of the things they should bear in fact. Secondly is sustainability. This program I'm trying to do, is it sustainable? Uh, a lot of people come in and they'll say, oh, I want to do this thing that um, I want to recycle plastics into bricks or into one product. And we'll tell them, it's a good idea, but is it really sustainable? Uh, are, you, are you going to have enough raw materials to really, are you going to get enough plastic to make this, turn this into a business? It might sound good for a small uh, um, area that you're trying to tackle, but when you look at it in a bigger scale, you start facing a lot of problems that might drive up the cost or make the problem you're trying to solve very difficult. So those are some of the pitfalls I can advise people that are trying to start new hardware products. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, I think in the last, few last sections mentioned about policy, and all that. And uh, I know, Julian, you had the opportunity to have worked with uh, some regulators like Sun and a few projects in different committee projects. And um, from your experience, what do you think regulators and companies can form a partnership? Like that kind of partnership instead of the pre predator relationship we had at the point that, you know, the, uh, the regulators are waiting for the company, the startups, the force for them to come and give them that sledgehammer. So how, how do you think that can be, you know, so, that she can form? So whether you like it or not, regulators, standard organizations, I mean, yes, I, I was privileged to sit at um, the technical committee at the Standard Organization of Nigeria for making one of the laws for um, hardware or electronics products. But whether you like it or not, you see the government, the regulators, the standard organizations, your quality team, they are key stakeholders in your design process. So the earlier you get them in the process, I, I don't mean getting them to come and sit down in the office and or in your house, but I mean getting them in any way, all right, the safer your business is. Because what, what people do um, in Nigeria whether from developing it here or bringing it in, we've seen so many big names. I, I don't want to call any names, but we've seen people invest millions of dollars in Nigeria, and a few months later you hear, oh, the government of Lagos State have announced that, you know, this so-so and so, and then before you know it, thousands of dollars, you know, go down the grain. You can use the bike hailing business for an example. Everything about bike hailing business. Sometimes three years ago, it was the ish. And then within a few days, thousands of dollars went down. Now, what I'm trying to say is this. Whether it's from the political point of view or the government point of view or the standard point of view, you see, a co-creation process allows you to have everybody in place. If you're building a drone, for instance... You know, you should be able to know every single stakeholders in the process of designing a drone and flying a drone. You don't want to finish building a drone with the initial sunk cost of mi uh, some million dollars and then you hear that there is a regulation. Yeah, there is a regulation about flying drones in Nigeria, yes. Mm -hmm. And then you hear that it, it, there is a regulation like that. And then... You, you know, the business guy, the guys with MBA have already done some market review. Oh, this is awesome. This is a graph of our customer base. And then you realize that you don't have a customer base. Now, what I'm trying to say, I, I used a couple of examples. What I'm trying to say is this. There are laws and regulations. 
in hardware industry and electronics, there are the likes of ISOs, the IECs, the Nigerian customized SONs, all right, for the regulatory part. There are government agencies regulating some aspect of product. If you're in food, there is NAVDAQ and co. If, if, it doesn't have to even be the product itself. It could be something that goes into a product. You could be building um, a machine that takes in a fuel, and then you realize that there is a regulation about fuel, and you need standardization. So, you know, for any business or hardware business for product development and for digital uh, manufacturing, it's very important and critical that from day one, these people are part of the process. You know, whether you're collecting the, the, their data, their standard. And then secondly, and the most important thing, we had HR stock. You know, we had someone who... Uh, from the HR team who clarified that we need to move away from the traditional way of hiring. No, when, when you hire, when you're designing or developing a product, in as much as you want to be as cheap as possible, be as realistic as possible to employ the competencies that can go outside the box to protect your design. Felix has mentioned about research and development and Ugo has mentioned about a whole lot that goes into, you know, capturing what the customer requires. So, yes, do not be surprised at the end of the day. Do not, you know, have this wonderful idea that you're lost and you never thought about the stakeholders. And after investing some good money into it, you're realizing that, you know, there is a risk um, in it. So, just get them into the process as early as possible. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think I, while you are speaking, I remember the startup, the head startup, had fantastic idea, huge products. On onboarding stage, you remember that the most important part of his driver of the business is the data, the medical data. And there's a law in Nigeria against even a doctor issuing out medical data to uh, of a patient without the patient. Even at some point, it has to have some level of verification for four you can actually issue out. And maybe another doctor with the, with the signature of the, of the patient will have to sign before a file can be transferred. And then, then this startup have a very amazing idea and wants to solve the health problem. Yeah. It can be everywhere. And then on getting to the market, is that on arrival. Yeah. Right, so, so this, these things happen a whole lot. Like, I received a whole lot where people do these mistakes and it's really... a like some for us to start having the, the final conversation while we're having the first conversation. Exactly. So it's very, very important for us to look at the laws, look at the, the key players and all that. But I, one last question I wanted to ask, and I wanted to get that to you. Uh, in the industry and the community hardware space, uh, you are one of the people that, oh, if I need something around hardware, I know like if I get to go call uh, uh, Google, and then uh, he will definitely get to have do wonders, like point out and all that. So, the question I want to ask in this regard is, what's, with, uh, what's your advice as to how startups and companies could actually build a striving and a sustainable business uh, looking at supply chain? Like, how do they, how do will you going to build a striving and sustainable business? Sustainability Driving that is how to be innovative, but having the supply chain and sourcing of those products at the heart of that, you know, of that strategic plan. Okay, um, that's a tough one. Um, because uh, in, in the manufacturing sector in Nigeria, a lot of things we, um, a lot of companies used to make things here are imported. So the, a lot of challenges we face here are that anything you design, you find out that locally you're not, a lot of your supplies are, are imported. And when most people try to uh, source look, um, in, indigenous for that thing, they, they, come, they face problems. So one thing I would tell people is that if you're building a product, Nigeria, 
Rather than using standards that you see in catalogs in America or the UK, start with your uh, local manufacturers. So if you're building, let's say you're building a stabilizer and the framework is um, aluminum, go down to Tower Aluminum, go down to all the guys that extrude aluminum in Oshodi, all the big companies, get their catalogs. Go to the guys that make sheet metal in Nigeria, get their technical information. Get, go to the guys that um, make, um, produce paint, get all their inf um, products and specification and start as much as possible to start using Nigerian made products to make maybe say 50 or 60% of your device. In that case, you will not have a lot of problems when, uh, uh, when you are sourcing these things. But a lot of people, a lot of times, a lot of times, this is false to deaf ears, and they'll say, yes, um, we found this product in Alaba. It's, uh, it's very good. The guy said he has a, a, a good supply. Okay, you buy his entire supply, and you make this product, and it's the market, and people like it. And when you go back to him, he tell you, uh, I'm sorry, uh, I don't have it. When you, look, when you go online and look for the supplier, they'll tell you that the factory has closed in China or in Italy. So that puts you in a very um, difficult situation because you've raised the bar so high and now people want the product and then now you're, you're going back to a local supplier to start sourcing. And by the time um, series two of your product comes out, people will not touch it because you have um, spoiled them with the first one. So it's quite imperative, but it's quite important that um, companies starting try as much as possible if they can to uh, use a lot of local content. I mean, that's one of the things we talk about in Nigerian foundries. We, we try as much as possible to source a lot of things that we use locally. When it can work locally, that we start to go outside to, to, to source. So um, it, it, that's what, what, one of the things I would like to say. Thank you. Yeah, so thank you so much, and I think I wanted to summarize with this uh, because I personally, in my organization, have had this whole Ohala problem. We had a project we needed to deliver by January, and by now we are still sourcing now and trying to deploy because some um, uh, is the first holiday, New Year holiday in China. We stopped lockdown in China. Products keep coming patches and patches. This product comes. We, they told us it's everything. We go there, it's just twenty percent and all that. And we keep giving the our client expectation, and each each time each expectation keep pushing every two weeks, every two weeks, and then we have three months something that's supposed to arrive January. So it's really um, uh, crazy to actually look at what's happening in the ecosystem. And I think one key area to just summarize that we have to start looking at is collaboration within the ecosystem, because because there is lack of collaboration within the ecosystem, a lot of people think that, oh, I just want to go to China, have a brother does it. But even in that China, there's a lot of collaboration. That company might receive it and outsource a lot of other things and then have a place they assemble and it's done. So if you have a lot of collaboration, you can actually leverage 50 to 70 percent of local content here. Oh, I have a machine shop here. I have somebody who is in uh, CNC, uh, lesser cutting. Oh, I have somebody who is in uh, this part. Oh, this is my core and are able to manage those local content and have that kind of deep collaboration. And I think in the next five years, we'll probably be having very great products that can compete with the likes of maybe uh, Apple and the rest of them. Because if we have access to the technology, which is accessible to everybody, I think we can also have, and we have the talent, we don't have the talent, we have been having the exports of talent. I think we get the process right and have more collaboration I think there's so much we can achieve together. So thank you once more, and uh, I think thank you, and uh, bye-bye.